uh, uh, Samuel Abushada was supposed to be here to introduce Richard. He couldn't make it. I apologize on behalf of them. Uh, and I, I, I thank the uh, Yapa, uh, the Yapa Youth Movement uh, for sponsoring this event. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to say anything about them. That, that would have been uh, to them when they were here. Uh, I'm just going to introduce our, our speaker. I'm sure you all know uh, who he is, uh, Richard Stallman, uh, the found, one of the founding fathers of the free software movement. And uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll Please turn off the light. I'll talk. I'll talk. <laughs> you don't have to make the talk. But please don't show me the light in my eyes. It's horribly painful. You just gotta, you gotta have some light some other way, but not like this. I can't deal with this. Okay, this is bearable now. <laughs> Wait, no, I want light on the audience so that I don't fall asleep. We either blind them or let them roll. Oh, really? There's no dinner. Blind them for boy. This is horrible. Any had dinner, but too? Uh, see, if I move here, I can start to see you. No. Is that better? Yeah. It's hard to see. Oh, no, no. <laughs> no, you see, the problem is, it's the difference. Of, oh, that's what's better for me. Is that okay right. for you? Is there anyone who is suffering from this? It's not good for you. Uh, well. Turn it off if you if, if they need it off. You got to turn it off. I have off. no idea how we got turned on. To be oh. <laughs> I have like four switches and two of them do nothing. So I don't think it was. Me. That's behind you. Is this okay for you? Okay, then it's okay for me. Let's go. If I stand here instead of here, I can bear it. Do I need the microphone? Is there, is there any reason why it's important for me to use this microphone? Please you raise your hand if you cannot hear me. If you are carrying a portable tracking and surveillance device, please turn it off, or better yet, take the batteries out, uh, because that's the only way you can reliably make sure it's not tracking you. <clears throat> Come in. So, uh, I'm mainly known for my work in the free software movement. And that's what I originally began giving speeches about. But this speech is about many different threats to our freedom in digital society. It's uh, customary to take for granted that digital inclusion is a good thing and that we should wish that for everyone. I don't agree. Digital inclusion can be good or bad depending on whether the society we are included in is just or unjust. And thus, digital inclusion in a non-free society is something we should all try to escape from. <clears throat> so, I've identified many issues that threaten our freedom in the digital society. Issues that we must pay attention to if we expect to participate in the digital society. And all efforts aimed at spreading digital inclusion should make sure that they spread inclusion in a just digital society and that they do not lead people as being, being victims of any of the harmful practices I'm going to talk about today. The first threat to our freedom is surveillance. Digital technology can uh, be used for surveillance. It's it lends itself to surveillance because when something is done by a computer, it's easy to make that computer record exactly what it's doing. It's easy to make people identify themselves 
and then build a database that has all the information about everything a person does. <clears throat> this is surveillance that Stalin could only dream of. Now, it's <laughs> really possible. All right, just a second. You have to squeeze the yellow buttons. See the yellow buttons on the sides? That's the yellow buttons on the sides. You squeeze them. Put the adapter in first and save it that way. And then, put, yes, now it's that. Now there's some kind. Thank you. My computer is hungry. Sometimes surveillance is done through our own computers and software. Many proprietary programs have surveillance features. One of them is Microsoft Windows. Then there is Real Player, Windows Media Player, Flash Player, and then the iPhone, which briefly became known as the Spy Phone. GPS navigators for cars, I'm told, many of them, if you connect them to the net to upgrade the map, they also say where you have been. But surveillance can also be done of our digital activities from outside our control. You see, if it's our own software that's doing the surveillance, that's because it's not free software. If we were using free software, we could make it not surveil us. But when surveillance is done in the ISP, there's no way we could stop that. The only way we can resist that is to have governments make it illegal. And unfortunately, they tend to do the exact opposite. Uh, in Europe, there is, in the European Union, there's a directive requiring retention of all the traffic data, which records basically who you communicated with for uh, for a, a year and a half in some countries, keep it longer. And this is proposed now for the U.S. as well. Now, this is dangerous because in any country there is a danger that the country will go into fascism. Uh, Israel seems to be going there right now. But any country could do this. Now, when a an authoritarian regime, a dictatorship is in power, people understand that they need to take precautions that if you're a dissident, you should be circumspect about how you communicate with other dissidents. But if when the dictatorship is established, there are years of records of who communicated with whom in the past, it's too late to take any precautions. Surveillance can also be done by systems that have nothing to do with our own act, our own use of computers. <coughs> For instance, in the UK, there is total surveillance of car travel. All car travel is tracked by cameras by the side of the road. So <clears throat> they have a database of everywhere every car has gone for years, I suppose, since they set this up. <clears throat> in a free society, you're not guaranteed anonymity for things you do in public. If you walk on the street, someone might see you and recognize you, and might remember it. And then someone later could ask if that person saw you, and that person could answer, or not. You see, she might decide not to say if she doesn't like the purpose of this. She might choose to forget. She might really forget. But uh, this information is diffuse. To collect it requires a lot of effort. So it's not done very often. It's only done when there is a powerful motivation. But with digital surveillance, all the information about a person can be collected in one database 
making it extremely easy to look up everything about anyone. And this is a tremendous difference. It's the difference between having some amount of privacy and having zero and being totally under the control of the authorities. And, of course, we can't rely on governments to respect our freedom and their use of surveillance. One thing that governments tend to do is label dissidents as terrorists and then try to, sub to sabotage and destroy their political activities. For instance, the UK has already used the information obtained by tracking cars to sabotage a protest. People on their way to a protest, or believed to be on the way, their way to a protest, were arrested and taken away so they couldn't get to the protest. So what could be more clearly unjust for a government to do than to sabotage democratic political activity? <clears throat> So when the surveillance is done through our own devices, we could stop that if we have control over those devices, for instance, if the software is free. But when surveillance is done by systems outside our control that, are, that aren't ours, the only way to stop it is through political activity. The next threat is censorship. Censorship existed before digital technology, but once we got the idea that digital technology would liberate our communication, governments didn't like that, and now they're making a press all around the world to impose censorship <coughs> on the net. Ten years ago, of course, countries like China and Iran censored the internet. You expect dictatorships to do that, uh, but Nowadays, it's not limited to obvious dictatorships. Nowadays, censorship is spreading. Several years ago, Denmark imposed filtering on access to uh, foreign internet sites. It blocked a list of pages, which was secret. People in Denmark were not supposed to know what they were being blocked from accessing. But someone leaked that list, and it was posted on WikiLeaks, whereupon that page was added to the banned list. Because the first rule of censorship is you don't talk about censorship. <clears throat> now there is internet filtering of one sort or another in France and Italy. Turkey has announced it, that every internet subscriber will have to choose between censorship and more censorship. <clears throat> the UK and the US are both discussing filtering, in fact, uh, <clears throat> and, and Australia has a peculiar system of censorship. Australia has been talking about imposing filtering for several years, but it has been blocked. However, Australia has censorship of links. In fact, Electronic Frontiers Australia, which campaigns for freedom in the internet, was ordered to remove a link to a foreign political website on pain of a fine of $11,000 a day. So basically, it's it's real censorship, and it can't be ignored. There are two standard excuses, the danger of which are both exaggerated greatly, that they use to impose censorship on the net. One is so-called child pornography. Uh, in the U.S., this so-called child may be 17 years old and may be having sex lawfully with someone else of a similar age, uh, but if they take a picture of it, that's so-called child pornography and they can go to prison for years. 
<clears throat> this excuse uses people's tendency to be exaggeratedly concerned about supposed dangers to their children. Dangers which in reality may be extremely small and distractions from other problems. Uh, <clears throat> but in any case, that's one. The other is terrorism. Now, terrorism is a real danger, but it's not as big as it's made out to be. Uh, and it's certainly nowhere near as dangerous as governments, especially if governments become non-democratic through means such as censorship. Compare, for instance, terrorists uh, attacked in the U.S. in September 2001 and killed almost 3,000 people. We are not really sure who they were because the official investigation was first limited and weakened and then corrupted. We know this is true. So there has never been a real investigation. We cannot know at this point whether people in the Bush administration were complicit in those attacks. So maybe yes, maybe no. I hope someday there will be a real investigation so we can know the answer. In any case, Bush used this as an excuse to launch a war which killed 4,500 Americans and on the order of a million Iraqis. So which is more dangerous, these unidentifiable as yet terrorists or the state? I am much more scared of the state. After all, uh, unofficial terrorists have, are few in number. They can only operate by sneaking around, and that limits how much harm they can possibly do, whereas the state has millions of people to use, and they don't have to hide the fact. They can go around with their guns and do things openly. So they're much more dangerous if we don't keep them in check. And censorship stops us from keeping them in check. So it, it basically, it's the first step by which the potential danger of the state can get loose. So we must not tolerate censorship. Censorship is more disgusting than anything else you might see in the internet. So <clears throat> they use these excuses, and we know their excuses. A representative of the international record companies stated at a conference that they're really <coughs> enthusiastic about, quote, child pornography, unquote, because that gives them an excuse to establish filtering. And once they have filtering imposed on the net, they can extend it to the things they really want to filter. So it's not just our imagination that one kind of censorship can be the thin edge of the wedge. We know that there are people who are trying to use it exactly in that way. Powerful organizations that we need to guard ourselves against. Now, too much censorship can cause an economic drain. In 1970, China cut itself off from the world with censorship. But that caused a lot of other inconvenience to China. So now they don't cut themselves off from the world, but they put effort into cutting off just the kinds of messages they really want to cut off and to shape what kinds of views are being expressed through the network. And it seems to effectively work as censorship without cutting China off from business. Well, that's sort of unfortunate, isn't it? If censorship had painful consequences to the censors, they might do it less. So we must not ignore this danger. We have to campaign against censorship. Ironically, China recently announced a plan to set up an uncensored piece of the internet in China 
for businesses serving foreigners. So Chinese people won't be able to get to those servers to get an uncensored internet, but foreigners will be. So this raises the possibility that people in countries that censor the internet might be able to get unfiltered internet access through companies operating in China precisely to give it to them. Now wouldn't that be funny? <clears throat> the next threat to our freedom in digital society comes from file formats designed to restrict. Sometimes they're secret, sometimes they're patented. Either way, it causes harm. Secret formats are used often for published data. For instance, there are typically, there, there are secret formats for uh, books, secret formats for music, secret formats for video, and those formats have the purpose of restricting the user, implementing digital handcuffs, specifically restricting what you can do with the data in your own computer. For instance, Italian public television distributes its programs on the net in a secret format and recommends the use of proprietary software to watch those programs. This is something that no public entity can ever legitimately do, communicate to the public in a secret format. This format is called BC1, and it's supposedly a standard, but it's a peculiar kind of standard because it's secret. In fact, the standards document is only available with a non-disclosure agreement. Now, that in itself seems corrupt. Many programs save the user's own data in secret formats. The user can work for years building up files of data for various projects and be unable to freely use her own data because she could only access it through the particular proprietary program that was implemented knowing the format of the data. And that program is, of course, designed to restrict what she can do with her own data. These are two kinds of malicious features. <clears throat> then there are patented formats. For instance, MP3 is patented. Several years ago, people who were distributing free software for MP3 were threatened with a lawsuit and they had to withdraw it and throw it away. <clears throat> Other patented formats include MPEG-2, MPEG-4, and this is why I tell people when they make recordings of my talks not to use those formats, not the secret ones, not the patented ones, to distribute the recordings of my talks. Only the formats that everyone is, can safely implement, and these are the OGG formats, OGG, and WebM. So, for instance, when you distribute copies of this recording, <laughs> do it that way. And also, please put on the Creative Commons No Derivatives License, because this is a statement of my opinions. And by the way, uh, if you take photos of me, please do not put them in Facebook. <laughs> Facebook is not your friend. So, <clears throat> we need to do something about those formats. The best thing is, don't make files in those formats. Flash is actually a similar problem, even though Flash is not secret, it might as well be secret because there's no free software that fully implements it. 
we've been trying. The problem is that they keep making new versions of Flash with different formats. So we, we implement one and they have another one. And our resources are limited, so we haven't been able to catch up. Now, we've implemented Flash version 8, but we haven't implemented 9 and 10. If you want to help with this, your help will be appreciated. <clears throat> so it has some of the practical problems of a secret format, even though it's not in fact a secret. <clears throat> The next threat to our freedom comes from the use of software that the users do not control. In other words, non-free software, proprietary software. With software, there are just two possibilities. Either the users control the program or the program controls the users. The first case we call free software, <clears throat> and the other is proprietary software, user subjugating software, software that tramples your freedom. So when I say free software, I'm talking about freedom, not price. It's not an issue of whether you paid something to get a copy. That's just a detail. It's not an ethical issue that we need to think about. Either way is okay. But whether it respects your freedom or not is vital. So free software is software that respects the user's freedom and community. And with those, the users have control over the program and control over the computing they do with the program. That's what's important after all. But in order to control your computing, you need to control the program you do it with. <clears throat> so the, de the more precise definition of free software is that the users have four essential freedoms. It turns out these are the freedoms you, that the users need in order to control the computing they do with this program. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish. Freedom one is the freedom to study the source code and then change it to make the program do your computing the way you wish. Freedom two is the freedom to help others. That's the freedom to make exact copies and distribute them to others when you choose, when you wish. And freedom three is the freedom to contribute to your community, which is the freedom to make and distribute copies of your modified versions. You're welcome to sit down if you wish. Go in. <laughs> oh, look at that! <laughs> no, you don't have to. Thank you. 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 Now, to see why these freedoms are important, you might want to compare programs with recipes. A program and a recipe are similar in a very broad way. Each one is a series of steps to carry out to get a result you want. So they're both works that serve practical use. You, you do practical jobs with them. Hello. Come in. Come in. Oh. <laughs> so, of course, people who cook need to have control over the recipes they cook. In the same way people who do computing need to have control over the software they use. So it's no surprise, therefore, to see that those same four freedoms correspond to what cooks do with recipes. What do you do with recipes? Well, you cook them the way you wish. You study them and you change them to make the kind of food you wish. 
you distribute copies of them, exact copies. And if you have changed a recipe, you can write down your version of the recipe and distribute copies of that. These are the things cooks do with recipes. Imagine if tomorrow the state told cooks, starting today, if you copy or change your recipe, we will call you a pirate and put you in prison. Imagine how angry everyone would be. Well, they haven't done this with recipes, but they have done it with programs. And if you imagine how angry the cooks would be if they did it with recipes, then you understand the anger that created the free software movement. Because they have no right to stop us from controlling our software. <clears throat> Now, one thing you will find in a lot of proprietary programs is malicious features. <coughs> Many proprietary programs have features that are not reserved, designed to serve the user, but rather to spy on the user, restrict the user, and there are even back doors which can attack and hurt the user. I've already talked about surveillance features, and I've talked about the digital handcuffs, the features designed to restrict what users can do with the data in their own computers. Back doors accept commands and then carry them out, and those commands can be designed to hurt the user. For instance, Windows has a back door that allows Microsoft to forcibly install changes in the software. Any changes in any software. Microsoft can install them without asking permission of the nominal owner of the computer. I say the nominal owner because once Windows is running in that computer, Microsoft has owned that computer. So Windows is malware. It's in the same way that a virus is malware. It's designed so it can hurt the user. <clears throat> we also know of malicious features in the Macintosh system, in Apple products such as the iPhone and the iPad, and in Flash Player which has surveillance features and digital handcuffs, in the Amazon Swindle they call it the Kindle because it's designed to burn our books. But that's a product that's extremely malicious. It's designed to swindle users out of the traditional freedoms of readers of books. For instance, the freedom to get a book anonymously, perhaps buying it with cash. Can't do that from Amazon. Amazon makes the users identify themselves. So Amazon maintains a gigantic list of all the books that anybody has ever obtained from Amazon. Such a list threatens human rights. It must not be tolerated to exist anywhere. Then there's the freedom to give, lend, or sell a book to someone else. Amazon eliminates those freedoms with digital handcuffs and by saying that the users are not allowed to own books. Amazon does not believe in private property, not for books. So Amazon says the user can't buy a book, the user can only get a license to read one under Amazon's choice of conditions. Then there's the freedom to keep a book as long as you wish. Amazon eliminates this freedom with a back door. We know about this back door by observation. We can't study the source code of the program. We can't tell what it can do. We only know what we have seen it used to do. In 2009, people discovered that Amazon had remotely erased thousands of copies of a particular book. These were authorized copies. They had been obtained directly from Amazon. So Amazon knew exactly where to find them and where to erase them. And the book with which Amazon demonstrated the Orwellian nature of its 
product was 1984 by George Orwell, I wouldn't dare make up something like this. It's too unbelievable to be acceptable as fiction, but it's the fact. That's a book that everyone should read because it describes a totalitarian state that did things like destroy books it didn't like. Well, there was a lot of criticism, so Amazon promised, we'll never do this again unless we are ordered to by the state. <laughs> yeah, not very comforting. So you should all read 1984, but don't read it on the swindle. <coughs> don't read anything on the swindle. It's a malicious device, and it's designed to, uh, to attack our freedom and to eliminate friendship between people who read. More about that later. <clears throat> so I can give you a lot more examples, but the point is malicious features are rife in proprietary software because the developers know that they have power, and that power tempts them. They know that the users are at their mercy. So being companies, in other words, totally greedy and unscrupulous, believing in an ideology that their primary mission in, is to get as much money as they can get away with, why wouldn't they abuse that power? Of course they abuse it. Whenever it seems useful to them, they abuse it. The point is they shouldn't have this power in the first place. With free software, the users <coughs> control the program. With proprietary software, the program controls the users. And who controls the program? The developer or the owner controls the program, and through it, controls the users. So a non-free program is an instrument of unjust power. That's what they want when they develop the program. What they want is the power over users that they get from it. And this is why you should never use non-free software, because you should never tolerate anyone's having power over you in that way. So that's why I started the free software movement in 1983. I wanted to make it possible to use computers and have freedom, which was impossible if you're using proprietary software. But in 1983, it was impossible to run a computer without proprietary software. The computer isn't useful without an operating system. And all the operating systems for modern computers back then were proprietary. So if you bought a new computer, in order to make it run, it needed to have an operating system in it, and that was always proprietary, and there went your freedom. I realized being one man without much fame and without much money, and with very few people who agreed with me, that I wasn't likely to change this to a political type of movement. And besides, I didn't know how. I was not a political organizer. I was an operating system developer. But I realized that meant I could change this in a different way. All I had to do was write an operating system. And then, being the author, I could legally make it free software. And then everyone would be able to use their computers in freedom by running my system. So I could give people a way to escape from the unjust power of proprietary software by technical work in my own field. So that meant I had been elected by circumstances to do this job. It was my duty. It's as if you see somebody drowning and you know how to swim and there's no one else around and it's not Bush then you have a moral duty to save this person. <laughs> However, perhaps that statement is too strong. Perhaps there are some other people about whom I should not assert a moral duty to save. <laughs> like maybe Cheney and Obama and Netanyahu. And, but who exactly we should be in this list, that's a hard question. And fortunately, I don't need to answer the question because I don't know how to swim. <laughs> but 
in the real case that arose in my life, the work to be done was not swimming, it was writing lots of software. So I decided to develop a free software operating system. Every piece of it would be free software. I decided to recruit others to help to finish it sooner. I decided <coughs> to follow the design of Unix, which was a proprietary system with some technical advantages. I decided by following the design, I would have the same technical advantages. And I decided to make it compatible with Unix, meaning the same commands that worked in Unix would work in my system the same way. So if you knew how to use Unix, you could sit right down at my system and use it. You wouldn't have to learn anything new. And then I gave it a name, which is a joke. The name of the system is GNU. And GNU is a recursive acronym. It stands for GNU's Not Unix. So GNU is GNU, but it stands for GNU's Not Unix. Of course, programmers love jokes with recursion, but that's not enough to make it a joke. To be a joke, it has to have another meaning. Why GNU and not ANU, FNU, or SNU? Because those are not words. GNU is a word. GNU is the name of this animal that lives in Africa. So with another meaning, that means it's a joke. But it's not just any old joke. Uh, GNU is the most humor-charged word in the English language because it's used in countless word plays. <coughs> because according to the dictionary, the G is silent and the word is pronounced new. So every time you want to write the word new, instead of spelling it N-E-W, you can spell it G-N-U and you've got a joke. <laughs> Perhaps not a very good joke, but there are lots of them. So when people see this word, they're almost ready to laugh already. Given a specific meaningful reason to use this word as the name of a programming project, I couldn't resist. But when it's the name of our system, please do not follow the dictionary. If you call it the new operating system, <laughs> you'll get people confused, you'll misinform them. We've been working on it for 27 years now, and we've been <coughs> using a variant of it for 19 years, so it's not new anymore. But it still is GNU, and it will always be GNU. How, there is, however, another pronunciation error you need to avoid, which sounds like Linux. <laughs> Strange to say, most of the people who use or talk about the GNU system call it Linux, which is a confusion. They're mistaken. Uh, when we had the GNU system almost complete in 1990, just one major component was missing which is the kernel. That's the component that allocates the computer's resources to the other programs you run. And then, well, in 1990, we had the, everything but the kernel. And so the Free Software Foundation hired somebody to write a kernel. But that project took many years because I chose an advanced design which made it something of a research project. But in 1992, Mr. Torvalds, who had a proprietary kernel called Linux, decided to liberate it. He released it as free software. And at that point, the combination of the almost complete GNU system and the kernel Linux was a complete free operating system, which was basically the GNU system, but not exactly, because it also had Linux in it. So it was a little different from the GNU system, but it was basically the GNU system. So what should we call it? GNU plus Linux seems like a good name to call it. Uh, but due to confusion by the people who combined them, they started. They were so focused on this one piece, which was Linux, that they perceived all the rest as a small add-on. And so they started talking about the whole thing as the Linux system, and other people picked that up from them, and so that's how it happened that millions of people use the GNU system in this variant, and they think it's Linux and that it was all started by Mr. Torvalds. Well, that's not really fair, so please call it GNU plus Linux or GNU slash Linux when you talk about it. Please give us equal mention. 
All we did was start the whole project, present the vision, and write the biggest part of the code. So equal mention is not too much to ask for. Well, nowadays, most of the people who think about the GNU system don't know it's the GNU system, and they also don't know it's free software. Those of you who are progressives have probably heard the concept of co-optation. Well, uh, basically, in the 90s, the success of GNU plus Linux brought lots of people into the free software community, but most of them only heard about the practical advantages and only thought about practical questions and they never heard the ideas of freedom that I told you today. So we had two political camps in the community. There was the camp of the free software movement, people who said, I want to use free software because I want freedom. And I'm going to work for my freedom, so I'll write free software. Of course, it's fun too. But the point is, there's a thing that we must do so that we can all have freedom. And then there were the people like Mr. Torvalds who rejected that idea who don't believe that users deserve to have freedom. But they like this free software, so they contributed anyway. And there was a debate between these two camps. But then in 1998, the people in the other camp coined another term, which is open source. So the meaning of open source is basically rejection of the ideas of the free software movement. Because they had a new term, they could choose which ideas to associate it with and which ideas to leave out. They chose to leave out the entire ethical level of the free software movement. We say that a non-free program is an injustice to its users. They don't want to call those. They don't want to call anything an injustice. They don't want to raise that kind of issue at all. So they constructed a discourse which doesn't raise it, which doesn't even hint at the idea that there might be something unjust about a non-free program. So instead of appealing to ideals of freedom and community, they appeal to practical values only. They say that it's useful to let users redistribute and change the program because then they will make the quality better. So the deepest value that they appeal to is uh, having better technical quality software, which is not very deep. So at the level of values, free software and open source disagree totally. At the practical level, they're more or less the same. Uh, which is no accident, because after all, they wanted to talk about the same software that we were talking about. So they drew up their criterion to cover more or less the same set of programs. In fact, as far as we know, every free program is open source, and nearly all open source programs are free software, but there are a few exceptions, because they didn't draw the line in exactly the same place we did. So at the practical level, uh, when in doing things like development of free software, we can cooperate with people who have open source views. There's no reason to reject their, their contributions. But at the philosophical level, at the political level, it's total disagreement. And that's why I object when people just talk about me in connection with open source because it's misrepresenting my views. You might as well suggest that I'm a member of we could. <laughs> well, maybe not quite that bad. <clears throat> because supporting open source doesn't mean you're advocating doing something that's bad. It just means you aren't criticizing what's bad. or you're not criticizing it, saying it's, it's bad. But you still might not ever do it. <clears throat> In any case, nowadays we still have these two political camps. 
And so it makes a difference which one you say. Free software and open source are not the same. If you want to promote the ethical values of the free software movement, you should say free software or say because it's good if people don't think it means gratis. So, uh, free software is the banner of our camp, and open source is the banner of the, of the other camp. And so, when you say these terms, you wave one banner or the other banner, and it's up to you to, describe, to decide which one you want to support. But do be aware of the difference. I hope you'll support our cause and that you'll wave our back. <clears throat> can it be both? Can you have two banners? You can if you like, which, which is sort of saying you're not going to take a side. <laughs> if that's where you stand, you have a right to stand there. But if you think that users deserve freedom and deserve to control the software they use, that means you agree with free software, and please show people that by waving our banner. Anyway, the last thing I want to say about free software is why schools must teach exclusively free software. It's wrong for a school to ever teach non-free software. And this means all levels of schools from kindergarten to university and all educational activities of any kind. The first reason is to save money. Now, free software is not necessarily gratis, and it's certainly not defined to be gratis, uh, but it can offer an opportunity to save money if you really want to. For instance, once the school system or the Ministry of Education has a copy of a free program, it's free to make as many copies as it wants and then give a copy to every school. This is freedom, too. Then the school, once it gets a copy, is free to install this program in all its computers and run them. That's freedom zero. And because they're free to do this, they don't have to get permission from anybody. And in particular, they're not required to pay for permission. So it's an opportunity to save money, which is a good thing for the schools since they don't have enough money. But of course, this is a secondary benefit. It's not the main reason. So when we cite this, we should always make it clear that this is a secondary reason. We should never let people think that this is what it's really mainly about, because the other reasons are more important. And besides, some proprietary developers eliminate the possibility of savings by donating gratis copies of their non-free software to schools. And why do they do that? Well, ah, well, that's interesting. Well, that shouldn't be allowed. I know. But, because you see, they, pr they pretend <coughs> these licenses are expensive when really it costs them nothing at all. But more than that, they're trying to use the schools as instruments to impose on society a dependence on their product. Here's how their plan works. They donate the gratis copy to the school. The school teaches the students to use them, and the students become dependent on that program. And then they graduate, still dependent. And after they graduate, the same developer doesn't offer them gratis copies. And some of them get jobs, and they work for companies. The developer doesn't offer those companies gratis copies. Oh, no. <coughs> this is like offering the school gratis needles full of addictive drugs, saying, inject them into your students to make them dependent. The first dose is gratis. <laughs> the school would reject the drugs, and it should reject the proprietary <coughs> software, whether gratis or not, because the school has a social mission, which is to educate good citizens of a strong, capable, cooperating, independent, and free society. In computing, that means teaching people to be free software users, what people who know how to be citizens of such a society. What do you think of the people who make a private Oh, I reject that propaganda. That's very, very common. Okay, first of all, uh, piracy means attacking ships. 
piracy? Well, the only piracy problem anywhere near Israel occurs, happens to the ships that try to go to Gaza. You know, no, I, 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 I know, but I refuse I mean, to I mean, use the word. Okay, okay. People, 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 who, people who make copies of the oh. no, right, uh, Okay. Without, what do I think uh, of uh, unauthorized uh, copies? Uh, of, yeah. What do I think of unauthorized copies of a proprietary program? Okay. They're bad because they're proprietary. <laughs> they're almost as bad as an authorized copy. <laughs> you see, if you uh, disregard copyright law and disregard the end user license agreements and distribute copies anyway, then you are acting as if you had freedom number two. But that doesn't give you freedom one or freedom three. Freedom one is the freedom to study and change the source code. You don't have the source code. And freedom three is the freedom to distribute your modified versions, but you can't make modified versions. So this is still a program that unjustly controls the users. In order for the users to control the program, they need to have all four freedoms. And if if they distribute if they redistribute copies underground, that's still not really a good thing. Uh, so you should reject proprietary software completely, even the unauthorized copies. Now, if you are using a proprietary program and your good friend asks for a copy, I think that the lesser evil is to give your friend a copy. Uh, but still, you shouldn't be using that proprietary program at all. If you <coughs> If you have a free software, you can make an unauthorized copy too, by not abiding by the right. Right, but the point is, <coughs> free software licenses have rules about how to distribute copies, but they allow you to distribute copies. That's why they're free software licenses, because they give you the four freedoms. Well, suppose uh, I have a project with a new free license and have a patent algorithm. I try to, to release this without any given the hazard. Well, that is unethical conduct. Right. I couldn't, he said, what if someone <coughs> releases a program as free software, but he has a patent on an algorithm used in that program, and then he uses that patent to sue the people who accepted the program from him? Well, this is obviously unethical, uh, and this is why version 3 of the GNU General Public License prevents you from doing that, because it gives people a patent license. No, but if you do it anyway, is that unauthorized copy? No, it's unethical. not an unauthorized copy, it's just unethical activity. Yeah. I'd rather leave the com I, I don't want to go into questions now. I haven't finished my speech. Please wait. Uh, I, I accepted questions, a question from Adam, you know, because, well, I respect him a lot, but, <laughs> but I, don't, I really, I normally want questions to wait for the end. I have more topics to cover. So, I want to finish saying why schools must teach exclusively free software, and that'll finish with free software, and then I'll move on to the other threats to our freedom. The next reason why schools must teach exclusively free software is for education of the best programmers. Natural born programmers at the age of 10 to 13 are fascinated with programming and they want to know how everything works. But when they ask, how does this work? If it's proprietary, the teacher can only say, it's a secret we're not allowed to find out. So education cannot begin. Proprietary software is knowledge withheld. It's the enemy of the spirit of education, and for that reason, no school should tolerate its presence in the school. It should be a firm rule. The only software that's allowed here is software you can learn about. <clears throat> but if the program is free, the teacher can explain what he knows and then invite the students to read the source code. Read it and you'll understand everything. 
and the teacher can say, if you come across any point you can't figure out, show it to me and we'll figure it out together. And that gives these natural born programmers a chance to learn a vital lesson if they want to become good programmers. And that is, that code is badly written. If even you can't figure it out, it's very unclear, so you shouldn't write code that way. You see, natural born programmers tend to be very clever. They can see lots of ways to write code so it will do the right thing, but nobody else will understand it. To become good programmers, they need to learn not to do all the things that aren't clear. So how do you learn to write good, clear code? You learn by reading lots of code and writing lots of code. Only free software gives you the chance to read lots of code of large programs we really use. And then you have to write lots of code, which means writing code in large programs. But when you begin to write the code in large programs, you have to do it in a small way, which means writing small changes to large programs. Only free software gives you the chance to do that. So nowadays, any school can give its students the chance to learn to be good programmers if they have the talent for it. But it has to be a free software school to give them the chance to master that talent. But there's a deeper reason for moral education, education in citizenship. Every school must teach not just facts and skills, but the spirit of goodwill the habit of helping others. Therefore, every class must have the following rule. Students, if you bring software to class, you may not keep it for yourself. You must share it with everyone else in the class who wants it, including the source code, in case someone wants to learn, because this class is a place for sharing knowledge. In order to set a good example, the school must practice its own rule. It must bring only free software to class and give copies to anyone in the class who wants it, including the source code. So these are reasons why we must campaign to move the schools to free software. There should be no proprietary software in a school. Schools, because they have a social mission, are the ones that have the responsibility to break the inertia. The biggest obstacle to free software is social inertia. One example is businesses mostly use Windows and schools mostly teach Windows. And when you ask the businesses to change, they say, well, but the schools are graduating Windows users. And when you ask the schools to change, they say, but the businesses hire Windows users. So each one is saying, we'll change after they do. Well, in that situation, None of them want to change. But the schools exist for a social mission, so we should order them to change. We should say, forget what the businesses are doing now and think about what we want them to be doing in the future. So that's the topic of free software. <clears throat> the next threat to our freedom that I want to mention comes from servers services on the net. There are actually two threats to our freedom. One is when the services do the user's computing for them. If people invite you to do your <coughs> computing in a server by sending all the relevant data to that server, where the computing will be done by you don't know what programs, you can't see them or touch them, and then the server will send the response back to you or perhaps it will take action for you on your behalf. And this way, your computing gets done in a place where you can't control it. So if you want to have control of your computing, you have to reject this. This is known as software as a service. It means your computing is done by the service. Now when I say your computing, I mean You've got some data, you want to do some computing on it and have a result. You could do that by running a free program in your own computer and then you have control over it. If you do it with a proprietary program, you lose control over it. The developer of the program has control over your computing that way. If you do it in somebody else's server, then 
the server operator controls your computing. So either way, you lose control of your computing. They produce the same problem, but they produce it in different ways. And the only solution is don't use either, don't do either of them. Don't run proprietary software and don't use software as a service. Now, most web servers are not software as a service. First of all, most, almost all web servers just publish information that you could look at. That's not doing any computing for you, it's just making the information available. So this issue doesn't arise. And there's no reason, at least not from this, that you shouldn't look at that information. But let's look at the small fraction that are non-trivial services. Most of these are not software as a service because they're not doing your computing. Most of them are doing communication of various kinds between you and others. And that's a different kind of thing. That's not something you could expect to do inside your computer. That's not something you could expect to have control over. You're not the only person involved. Why should you have the control? Why not the other, another person instead? Uh, so it's a different kind of issue. You can't expect to have control over, over an activity which involves you and other people. So there's nothing particularly bad about a service which does this communication. You're going to have to use the network after all, which means various network, various network actors are involved in passing the data around. So it's a different kind of case, and this issue doesn't apply to it. <clears throat> So software as a service is a rather special case, but it does exist and you've got to be on the lookout for it. For instance, uh, this talk is, comes out of a paper I wrote for an, uh, an IEEE conference. And they asked me to prepare a PDF file of a special kind and they suggested that I do it by using a site that they recommended to me where I would have to log in and identify myself and it would convert the file. And I said, that's software as a service. I'm not going to use that. Fortunately, I found a free program to do the same job. They hadn't recommended running the free program. They told people to give up the control to this service. Well. Okay, I said no to it, and I put this in the paper, too. Uh, so I did the job on my own computer with a free program, which is the way that the user has control over what's going on. Another example of software as a service is translators. There are various translators. You can send some text to the translator, and it translates it to a different language and sends that back to you. Well, that's doing your own computing. You've got the sentence and you want to translate it. There isn't a free software I can't hear you. I'm sorry. What did you say? There aren't a free software for the full translation of the... Yes, that's true. But just as I won't use proprietary software, I won't use software as a service. There are things that I can't do with computers because I value my freedom and I won't give it up. So if I would like to do something with a computer, but it, I, there's no way I can do it except by sacrificing my freedom, I keep my freedom and I don't do it. You see, freedom requires a sacrifice sometimes. If you reject the idea of making any sacrifice, and if what you stated was the start of an argument that says, but sometimes there's no, you want to do a job and there's no way to do it with free software, and what follows from that? Well, if that's an argument that in that case it's okay to use non-free software, what you're saying is that you will sacrifice your freedom for the practical immediate desire. Well, if those are your priorities, you're going to end up without freedom. The only way to keep your freedom is to be ready to defend it. And that means making at least somewhat of a sacrifice to keep your freedom. People who say, yes, I'd like to have freedom, but not if it costs me anything. They're going to lose their freedom. 
And I point this out because you'll encounter a lot of such arguments. When if you cam campaign for free software, you'll hear a lot of people making res who respond in ways that implicitly say, I like freedom, but I don't value it at all, so I won't make even the tiniest sacrifice to keep it. And, of course, they don't say that. They treat that as implicit. They leave that unstated, and they just talk about applying this, that, that principle of theirs to a specific case. So to respond to it, you've got to drag the assumption out in the open. Anyway, software as a service is a service that takes control of your computing. But if it's not, if most services are not software as a service. This issue doesn't arise for most services. But there's another issue, which is how do they treat your data? And lots of services get data from you or figure out things about you, and they can mistreat, they can abuse you by mistreating your data. What are the bad things a, a service can do with your data? Well, it could leak that data, perhaps, to Big Brother. It can garble the data. It can make it hard for you to get the data back out, and it can lose the data. <clears throat> now, leaking the data to Big Brother is something you can be sure any U.S. company is going to do. And also, subsidiaries in other countries of a U.S. company, they will do this. In fact, the U.S. passed an unjust law called the USAP at Riot Act, although they pronounce it slightly differently. It was passed using the 2001 terrorist attack as an excuse, uh, a great excuse to attack American freedom. And one thing this law said was when a company has records about in individuals, it has to hand over those records to the police without even a court order. So if you give any information about you to a, uh, a service run in the U.S., you're telling Big Brother. And the FBI uses this power all the time. And even though the legal limits on the power are very weak, the FBI doesn't obey them. Uh, senators who are in the relevant committee said they're not allowed to tell us what it is, but if we knew what the FBI was doing with this power, we would be disgusted. So, this is why I mention whenever I can that the state is more dangerous than terrorists because we've got to keep the power of the state in check. And the state uses terror, our fear of terrorists as an excuse to trample our rights. So how do we resist that? We point out that the state is potentially more dangerous and in practice more dangerous than the terrorists is trying, it says it's trying to protect us from. So, <clears throat> What else could it do with our data? Well, it could uh, it could garble the data. They're not so likely to do that because the users would notice. But they can also stop the users from getting their data out in a usable form. And uh, which means basically you enter lots of data when you ask, okay, please show me all my data because I want to use a different service instead then you find that you can't get that data out in a convenient form. You'd have to enter it in the other service afresh, which of course is a lot of work, so you will decide not to switch. This is known as user lock-in, and it's another kind of nasty practice that's quite common in, in business in, in the digital society. And the other thing they can do is lose the data. Now, of course, 
you could, they can also lose the data by accident. And that can always happen. That's a, a problem of life that no one can entirely eliminate. But uh, one way you prevent it is by making backups. And if the company, you're, the service you're saving the data with is just another backup, well, then it's not so bad if they lose it, because the point of having multiple copies is there's always a certain chance any one of them might get lost, but it's less likely that two of them will get lost. <clears throat> However, so the danger of losing the data is mostly not, not malicious. It's mostly just a problem that things go wrong in life. But occasionally they can lose data intentionally. Several years ago, Someone in the U.S. posted that a uh, that his uh, that the company that did his email had deliberately lost his mail and his address list. At first, they said it was an accident, and yet they were over and over unable to fix it. And then they admitted that they had been told by the U.S. government to lose his to lose his data. And that transforms it from a regrettable accident to malice. He said this was because he was a lawyer and his clients were people he suspected that the U.S. government wanted not to have proper legal representation. Well, basically, uh, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't depend on such companies and trust them to do anything right for you. That we, in any case, you should always have other copies in everywhere of all the data that supports you. Another relevant point is <clears throat> you'll have more legal rights over your data when it's physically in your own position than you will if you stored it in any company's computer. If you store the data in a company's computer and the government wants to get it, it can subpoena that data from the company. It doesn't have to tell you. So you don't have a chance to go to court and argue against the subpoena, which is what you would do if anything were subpoenaed from you. So uh, there are many reasons to be wary of services based on what they might do with your data. Well, of course, some data is important and some you might not care much about. But even if they just, if it's just a matter of knowing who it is who's using the service, they can form a pretty large picture of your life that way. And that's why I never <coughs> identify myself to websites. So, for instance, I, and also, I, I generally do my browsing from computers which are not mine and which are otherwise used by other people, <coughs> so they can't tell from which computer it is that these queries are all from me. Another way you can prevent that is by using Tor, which is a, a free program that will route your browsing queries through a maze of other servers before they get to the final place you're trying to look at. So that the places that get to, that ultimately provide their pages to you can't tell that those requests are from you. But that only works if you never identify yourself. So you shouldn't log in on websites, except very rarely. The next threat to our freedom comes from the war on sharing. Digital technology is ideal for sharing. We can share copies of whatever works we have. If you have a copy of something, you could give me a copy. This is easy and it's tremendously useful. It's an important part of society now. So, to 
stop people from doing this is evil, but there are companies that want to stop people. Typically, they are the companies of the copyright industry, publishers. They want to stop people from sharing, but that's very hard to do. When something is easy, beneficial, and useful, people will do it. And only harsh and nasty measures can possibly stop them. So, of course, the measures they try are harsh and nasty. For instance, one measure that was tried was suing teenagers for hundreds of thousands of dollars. And another measure that was tried was digital handcuffs, the malicious features in proprietary software that are designed to restrict what people do with the data that in their own computers. Another measure is internet filtering. Another measure, in other words, censorship. Another measure that's being tried now is punishing people when they're accused of sharing. Now, that discards the basic idea of justice, no punishment without a fair trial. But trials are too inefficient for them. They are determined to punish people very efficiently, even if that means discarding the basic principles of justice. <coughs> so we need to end the war on sharing. We need to legalize sharing. Sharing is good, so it should be legal. And we need to reject propaganda terms like piracy. When people ask me what I think of piracy, I say, hacking ships is very bad. <laughs> Sometimes people ask me what I think of music piracy. And I might say, well, I once saw the Pirates of Penzance. Uh, or I might say, and, and, I, and I had fun watching it. It's an operetta by Gilbert and Sullivan about pirates. Anyway, uh, sometimes I'll say, uh, from what I've read, when pirates attack, they don't do it by playing instruments very loud and badly. Instead, they use arms. So it's not music piracy. The point is to reject the propaganda meaning of the term. Because when you use the term with their propaganda meaning, you're helping their cause. <coughs> Another propaganda term they use is, quote, intellectual property, unquote. But that's a worse propaganda term. You see, the, the problem in the term, quote, piracy, unquote, is just bias, prejudice. It's an easy problem to explain. The problem of, quote, intellectual property, unquote, well, there is an element of bias that comes from the word property. If you call copyright, quote, property, unquote, you're giving the wrong idea, because copyright is supposed to be a behavior modification system that gets people to write more and make more art. So uh, it's not intended, it's not Copyright doesn't exist because authors deserve special treatment. That's not the reason for it at all. It's supposedly a scheme to promote writing. Uh, but there's a worse problem in, quote, intellectual property, unquote, and that is it confuses copyright with a dozen other unrelated laws. And these laws, in terms of their practical requirements and effects, have nothing in common, absolutely nothing. It is a mistake to take two of these laws and talk about them together, as if they were one issue. So when anyone says he's talking about the, quote, issue of intellectual property, unquote, he's already talking nonsense. Because he's saying that all these laws are one issue. And he probably doesn't even know all the laws he's lumping together and treating as one issue. But even just copyright law and patent law are totally different in practice. To treat them as one issue is a terrible confusion. So the only sensible, the only way to talk thoughtfully about any of these laws is to pick one law and call it by its name and talk about that one law. 
people who in law school study these various laws know how different they are. They know that they're really totally separate topics. But most people have not gone to law school and they don't realize that these laws are totally different. So this term, quote, intellectual property, unquote, leads people astray. It gives them a false picture of the facts of the law because they think that it means that, that these laws are called by that term because they're similar. Well, they're not similar. The people think, oh, these must be different species of one genus. Well, they're not. They work totally differently. So that term should never be used. And when somebody does use it, that means that person is starting a confused discussion about a bogus topic. And to make the discussion clear, to, to, you've got to reroute it. You've got to say, you are jumbling together a dozen different laws and saying nonsense. I'm sure that there's something meaningful that you have in mind, but it's probably about one particular law. Which law is it? What is the topic that you really are talking about? And once you have got the topic narrowed down to one law, then it becomes possible to find out what the facts are and what the effects are and have a meaningful discussion. It doesn't, this, this doesn't guarantee the discussion will be intelligent or thoughtful, but at least it creates the possibility that it can be. Now, the companies that carry out the war on sharing say they're doing this for the artists. And they say that if you share, you're stealing from the artists. Well, that's a typical half-truth that's worse than a lie, except it's really more like a 10% truth. <coughs> uh, because for the most part, the publishers are stealing from the artists and leaving nothing that we could possibly take. But there are some exceptions, you know, there's some superstars and the publishers treat the superstars very nicely. Consider music, for instance. When uh, the, uh, if, uh, my main way of getting music is by buying commercial CDs. And whenever I do, I feel ashamed because I know I'm not supporting the musicians. I know that the record company will get that money and will not give any of it to the musicians because they almost never do. There is theoretically a certain fraction of the price that's for the musicians, but they won't get it. The reason they won't get it is that the same contract which says that that fraction is for the musicians also says that the production and publicity expenses are treated as an advance to the musicians which means that this fraction of what I pay will go to th theoretically repay this so-called advance. And it almost never happens that a record sells so many copies that it finishes repaying the so-called advance and actually starts giving money to the musicians. It just doesn't happen. A record can go platinum and not sell enough copies for, this, for the musicians to get any money. Now, this doesn't, uh, well, the exceptions are the long-established superstars. Because if the musicians come to the end of their first contract, which typically covers five or seven albums, then the contract ends and they're free to negotiate another contract. And being stars, they have clout, so they can get a contract that doesn't exploit them, which actually does give them money when their record is bought. But that's only for their subsequent records. Their first five or seven records, they remain under the first contract. And so they never get any money for buying those. So you see how bad it is. This is not to say that the other musicians get no benefit from having a record contract. They get the benefit of the publicity, which means more people come to their concerts, and they have more concerts. So they do make money but not through the copyright system. So it is useful to give musicians publicity, but let's do it in a different way. 
We have a healthier way to give them publicity. Mail the music to your friend. Copy and share. That's healthy publicity because it's not controlled by money. <clears throat> and you'll find this tendency to treat the stars very nicely and exploit everyone else <coughs> sp spreads across the media. Someone who had published a best-selling book in the U.S. published her accounts. She hadn't made very much money from that book. Oh. I just got a cramp in my toes. <laughs> Um, just by stretching, it's strange. Uh, so, the existing system as a system for supporting artists is almost a total failure. <coughs> it does, it does, it does the job a little bit. But if you're not a star, it doesn't do the job adequately. And yet it's in the name of this imaginary, mostly imaginary support for artists that the companies wage their war on sharing. It turns out that the existing system supports the companies very nicely, just not the, most of the artists. So I think we do want to support artists because it's useful to support the arts. If, if we support artists, there will be more arts. And I'm in favor of that, but not at the expense of freedom. I'll give money, I just won't give my freedom. So, at least, at least not freedom that's important, like the freedom to share. So I propose other methods to support artists that aren't based on stopping people from sharing. Here's one, use tax funds. Either take them from the general budget or establish a special tax on internet connectivity or blank disks or any such thing. The crucial thing is what do you do with the money? How do you use it? It should be distributed directly to artists, directly to the creative participants in making the works, and not to companies. And we should make sure the companies can't claim it back in any fashion. But how do we divide it? And, and that way we make sure that this money really goes to artists, which it won't do if we pay it to the publishers. But what, how do we divide this up? The existing system pretends to support artists based on their popularity. Well, I'll keep that idea. Let's divide it based on the popularity of each artist, which we can measure through polling without surveillance. But how should the amount of money depend on the popularity? The most obvious choice is linear proportion. If A is twice as popular as B, A would get twice as much money as B. Well, a superstar can be a thousand times as popular as a fairly successful artist. But if we, if we give A a thousand times as much money as B, then either we're not giving B enough for everyday expenses, or we're making A tremendously rich, which means either way the system is not working well. So to make it work well, instead of linear proportion, let's use the cube root. Let's, the cube root looks like this. Let's take the cube root of each artist's popularity figure and divide the total money based on those cube roots. So if A is a thousand times as successful as B, A being a superstar and B being a fairly successful artist, then with the cube root, A will get ten times as much money as B. Not a thousand times, just ten times. Which means that of the total money available, only a small part will go to all the superstars and most of it will go to a large number of fairly successful artists. So this is a system which can support artists in general much better with much less money. 
And that's why it doesn't matter so much how the money is brought into the system, because it's not that much money. It's much less than we pay now. And yet we'll support most artists better. And superstars won't maybe get as much as they get now, but they'll still get plenty. <coughs> they'll still be quite comfortable, even if they're not rich. And they might still get rich from other ways. I'm not in intending to prohibit that, but there's no need to design this system to ensure they get rich. The other method I propose is with voluntary payments. Imagine if each player had a button, and you push the button, and it sends a certain sum of money to the artists who made the work <coughs> you playing or the last work you played. And you can push the button or not. It's up to you. Nothing tries to make you push the button, but you'll feel good when you do. The amount of money sent needs to be small enough that a lot of people won't hesitate to give that much money. Like, I don't know, maybe a half a shekel. A lot of people in Israel would pay half a shekel and they'd hardly even think about it. Why wouldn't you give that money now when you listen to or watch something you like? Because <coughs> it's too much trouble. It's not that you think half a shekel, I can't spend half a shekel on this today. No, it's that there's no obvious way you could give it. If you wanted to give it through PayPal, you'd have to find where to send it. Then you'd have to put up with the fact that only half of what you sent would arrive, most likely, because there's a big overhead in PayPal. And you'd have to identify yourself, which is a bad thing. So. There's so many discouraging factors besides the money you would give up. So I'm saying let's get rid of all those secondary discouragements. If the only reason that you would have not to send half a shekel was that you'd have half a shekel less, you'd send it from time to time, maybe even once a day. Of course, there are people who wouldn't. Poor people would never push that one. And that's good. There's no need to squeeze money out of poor people to support <coughs> artists. There are enough non-poor people who can easily support the artists. Let the poor people save their money for other things. Actually, I think that was invalidated. Oh, but in any case, I'm not finished. Please. I have another threat to our freedom to talk about. So in any case, these are the two methods I've proposed. There are many variants of them. They can be combined. We can design a, a number of systems to support artists. But what they both have in common is that they're not based on discouraging sharing. On the contrary, artists will want you to share their work because they'll expect to make more if you share their work. The last threat to our freedom in the digital society is the fact that we don't have a right to keep doing whatever we're doing. In physical society, there are many things we do and we have a right to do them, and no one has a right to stop us. We don't depend on anybody else's choice to enable us to do things in the digital society, in the physical world. If you want to go out on the street and hand out leaflets, you can do it. Uh, you don't need to beg somebody to please let you. Uh, if you want to put a sign outside your house, you could probably do that too. Of course, there are, this is to some extent limited in Israel now. There are certain things that you're basically not allowed to say nowadays in this society that doesn't respect fundamental human rights. But it's much worse in the, uh, in the digital society because what we do in the internet depends on companies to enable us to do it. And those companies have no obligation to provide their services to us. 
so you can, if, if, for instance, if you want to have a website, you need a domain name, so you need the cooperation of a domain registrar, and you need to have a connection of your server to the internet, so you need an ISP, or maybe you need a hosting company. And they don't have to do anything for you. They can cut you off. Your activities on the internet can be cut off by companies that choose to stop you. And the danger of this became clear last year when the United States launched a distributed denial of service attack against WikiLeaks, which means that the US went to the various companies that were providing internet service to WikiLeaks and told them, stop providing this service to WikiLeaks or we're going to make your business unpleasant. And the companies stopped. And WikiLeaks had no protection against this because you don't have a right to do anything on the internet. First, the US went to Amazon. Uh, WikiLeaks was using an Amazon server to distribute its documents. And Amazon cut them off. And then, I'll answer questions at the end, unless it's for clarification of what I'm saying. They can do it even if you buy a domain. Can you? Uh, they, they can, they can uh, do it even if you buy a domain, yes, and even if you pay for, for the they service. Did that. Absolutely, and, yes. And, and, not, and not for only free services. Yes, absolutely, they can. WikiLeaks was paying for that Amazon server. That's not a gratis service, but Amazon cut them off without having to justify the decision. There was no trial. Amazon just said, we think that there's something a little bit unclean about what you're doing, so we're shutting off your service. And domains were taken away from WikiLeaks as well. Domains which WikiLeaks had purchased, of course. That's what you do, you buy domains. But they can still be taken away from you, uh, and that's what happened. And then, then the U.S. went after the payment companies. Now, in the physical world, if you say, I'm collecting donations, and <coughs> would you please donate, people can come and they can put coins into your hand. You don't need some company's help to accept their coins. But there is nothing like coin in the internet except perhaps Bitcoin now. So, uh, in general, payments are done with the help of companies, and those companies can cut you off. So the U.S. went to PayPal and told PayPal to stop processing payments to WikiLeaks, and it did. And then the U.S. told Visa and MasterCard to stop processing payments to WikiLeaks, and it did, and they did. Uh, and then the Bank of America uh, said it would not send any money to WikiLeaks. And some people started moving their money out of that, including the Free Software Foundation, by the way. We moved our savings elsewhere. Uh, the Free Software Foundation never sends money to WikiLeaks because Wiki, uh, the Free Software Foundation's charitable mission is to promote free software. WikiLeaks is something else. But there's no reason we should tolerate a, a bank that would restrict who we can send money to. The point is that these, again, these were not imposed through some trial. WikiLeaks never had a chance to defend itself because no user of the internet has any rights where these things are concerned. Now, I've heard that PayPal later on did resume <coughs> processing payments to WikiLeaks. Well, that's good, but it shouldn't have ever stopped. Meanwhile, there's a company in Iceland that was collecting money for WikiLeaks, as well as collecting money from its customers for the services it provides, and Visa and MasterCard cut it off, and now it's